thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your peace this morning, Lord. Father, you know the situations. You know the challenges. You know what your people are facing right now, Father. I pray that you'll use me as an instrument to deliver this word, Father. Not with any human intellect, Father, or ideas, Father, or emotion, my God. But, Lord, that your word come and touch every life, Father. I stand here, Lord, as a vessel available for you to use right now. So I step back, Holy Spirit, ask you to step in and take over right now, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that for every person that is here today, Lord, those that might have have hurt in their lives and rejection and pain, whatever it might be that has caused them, Lord, to, to withdraw from society, to withdraw from people, Father. I pray right now, Lord, the word will penetrate, Lord, the darkest places, Father will break down, Lord, the highest walls, Lord. And I thank you right now that it will touch lives and bring change. And so I give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Holy Spirit, energize this atmosphere. Energize every heart and every person here right now, Father. I pray that they receive your word, Lord, with gladness this morning. As we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone who loved the Lord said, Amen. Amen. I want us to uh, uh, read from two passages of scripture. The one is in uh, 1 Samuel 17. This is the story of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel 17. And then we're going to turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 35. Now I'm not going to read the entire passage of 1 Samuel 17. Because it's quite a bit to read. And I don't want to take up too much time. So I'm going to get to the point where, where David comes to the battlefield. His father sends him to the battlefield. And, and uh, this morning, the message, for those of you that have not seen it on social media, the message this morning is entitled, The Faithful and the Faithful. The Faithful and the Faithful. Now, some of you might have to turn to your neighbor and ask them for their teeth. To put it in your mouth so that you can say faithful. Because <laughs> if I say, say faithful and faithful, say faithful and say faithful. If you can't say faithful, put it in your mouth and you say faithful. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let's read. So, so, David, so David gets to this point where he comes to the battlefield. His father sends him. And he gets to the battlefield. And he, he's gone with a specific purpose. And it's in verse 23 of 1 Samuel 17. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. Out of the armies of the Philistines and spoke according to the same words and David heard them. And all the men of Israel when they saw the man fled from him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel he has come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke, spoke to the men that stood by him saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab his eldest brother heard when he spoke unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why comest thou hither? With whom hast as thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your naughtiness of your heart, for you came down that you might see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Tell your neighbor, Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spoke after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard in which David spoke, were rehearsed, 
Then before Saul, he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fear, fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. And, and Saul said to David, thou art not able to fight this Philistine. Or to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of its mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, you will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. And he took his staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And a sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. When, David, when, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear, with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and strike thy head from thee. And I will give, it, give the carcass of the host to the Philistines this day, unto the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is God, a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with a sword and a spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. That David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it. And smote the Philistine on his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the, to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him. And cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the, the until thou came to the valley and to the to the gates of Ekron and wounded the Philistines, wounded of the Philistines, the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sharem, even unto Gath and to Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put, it, put his armor in his tent. Let's turn to Mark 4. Let's read from verse 35, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And the same day, when, the, when evening had come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent the multitude away, the multitude, and took him, took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship. 
so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Hallelujah. I want to talk a little bit just about faith and faith. definition of faith, if you go and read a dictionary, it'll say something like something that is destined to happen. Anybody say, if anybody hear anybody say, oh, this may lot, this is how it's supposed to be. It's destined to be this way. Anybody hear people speak that way? Faith says it's destined to happen turn out or act in a particular way. And so, I want to help the church this morning. You need to understand something. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible declares that in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I think it's verse 15, says, I said before you life and death. Come on now. It says choose life. There are many times there are two destinies. You need to find the destiny, the road, the place, the path that you are on. If you read read in the book of Mark chapter 7, Jesus speaks about the narrow and the broad. Come on now. And just like God has a destiny for your life, so the enemy has a destiny. He wants to bring destruction. The Bible says the broad road leads to destruction. But Jesus says, enter into the narrow gate. Now, not many people, the Bible says, are on that road. I don't know about you, but it takes faith to stay on that road. It's getting quiet here this morning. It takes faith to stay on a narrow road. I hear too many people, they just accept their faith. Let's talk about people that are ill. People that have terminal illnesses. They get to the point where they say, you know what? I accept it. If I, got, if I have six months, if I have three months, I just accept it. You don't have to accept the condition that you're in. Because if you understand what Christ did on the cross, he took the cancer upon himself. So you don't have to sit with the cancer. Listen carefully. I'm just building some foundation here this morning. So there are too many people that accept faith. They accept their financial situation. The Bible says that Jesus became poor. Ah, oh, no, uh, uh, apostle, no, 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 you, you misinterpret the scripture. So no, 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 my Bible says Jesus became poor so that you could become rich. No, 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 I don't understand, apostle. That means uh, spiritually, you know. He humbled himself in the spiritual God. No, 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 no. If you read the scripture, go into the Greek translation. The Bible says, when it says rich, it speaks about material possessions. Go and study. You Bible students, go and study that word rich. It says material possessions. Tell your neighbor, God wants me to be rich. Tell the other person, God wants me to have money. Tell the other person, God wants me to have stuff. So don't tell me, oh, you don't understand. The scripture says that Jesus became poor so you can become rich. So if you have, if there's poverty in your life, you better break that poverty off because that's, that's, you are living unscripturally. He became poor so you can become rich. Ah, it's my my faith, it's my, my lot. Play my he. Ek. 
asma su. No one speaks like that in your circle, say. I read about this. Come on now. But if you really knew why he died, you wouldn't accept half of the things that you do. You accept mediocrity. He hasn't made you mediocre. You accept being the least. He wants you to be in front. He wants you to be the head, not the tail. So I want to encourage the church this morning. Too many people are accepting fate. They're looking at their current condition. They're looking at their current situation and they determine this is fate. I want to say to you, it's not. I want to say to you, it's not fate. Because it's time that you use faith instead of fate. Listen carefully. I'm just building some foundation here this morning. The Bible says, now so some of you say, oh, but I don't think I have faith. The Bible says in Romans 12 verse 3 that God has dealt to every man and woman the measure of faith. The measure of faith. So don't tell me this morning that you do not have faith. Because he's given you a measure. How you exercise and use that measure. Because that measure can be like yeast. How many of you know if you apply yeast to a little bit of flour and water, what happens? It rises. Uh, the Bible says yeast is, uh, the Bible says faith is, a, is like a mustard seed. It's one of the smallest seeds you can find. I don't have an example here, but if you've seen a mustard seed, it's very small. It's like a, a pin's head, a pin head size. That's the size of mustard seed. And if you plant that mustard seed, it grows to be one of the biggest trees. Now, some people don't grow their faith to that level because of things in life, because of people, because of family, because of work, because of words, because of what they've seen, because of what they've heard. Their faith grows to a certain point and no further. And then after that, it's no longer faith, it's fate. It's fate. You don't hear them speaking faith. You hear them speaking faith, 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 faith. There's no faith. They took their teeth out. <laughs> they extracted it themselves. <laughs> you remember this, don't worry. When you go home, you remember this. Yes, I'll go. I'll be part of this too. Because God wants you to hear something this morning. He wants to grow your faith. Don't tell me that your age or what. I can give you examples in the Bible. God used the old people. The old men, sir. To prove a point to you and me. You'll take an 80 year old, a 90 year old, a 100 year old to prove a point to you and me. So, you know, I did that so that you can't come with any excuses. Oh, but Lord, you know, say, uh, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 30. Oh, sorry, Lord. Then you must apologize. You must repent because can't be your age, can't be your background, can't be your education. You can't use any of those excuses to God. Because you say, but I didn't I do it for that one? Didn't I do it for that one? Didn't I do it for that one? Come on up. Now I'm going to talk a little bit. How many of you like painting? One, two, three. No, I don't expect everyone to like painting. Come now. Because if everyone put up their hands, and I'll say, there's a bunch of liars here. <coughs> Not everyone likes painting, but I want to, I want to bring this analogy to you. Because this, as I was preparing the message, this is how the Lord gave it to me. Listen carefully. Accepting your fate is like accepting defeat. And in life, every day we wake up, 
You know what God gives you? He gives you a blank canvas. A blank canvas. You know what a canvas is for the painter? A canvas is like, wow, I can use this. So it's, think of it as, as cream or white. And now you have a brush in your hand or a few brushes. And you have some paint. And you, for that day, you start painting. Listen carefully now. He gives you a blank canvas every day. And you paint. Now some of you say, ah, 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 not me. Okay? Okay? Now, listen carefully. Every time something happens to you for that specific day, or words come to you, the word translates into an image. The word translates into a picture. You have not a good picture, or maybe a great picture. That is the painting you sketched or painted for that day. Listen carefully this morning. When he gives you a new day, he gives you the canvas. And you are busy sketching for that day. You're busy painting for that day. Whether it be a pencil or whether it be a, some, 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 some paint and a brush, you are busy painting. Listen carefully. He wants you to paint images of success. He wants you to paint images of beauty. The pen is going to drop soon. He wants you to paint all of this. So every day we wake up, we have an opportunity to choose life. To pick up the brush and to paint life. Listen carefully. But some of us need some new brushes. Because your brushes have been worn out already. Because you've painted in excess. I'm going to explain that now. You've been painting and painting and painting that your brushes are completely worn out. Now I'm going to give you facts here today that I'm going to read shortly. In the next, next, next one is, some of you have no brushes. You're just a blank canvas. You're emotionless. There's nothing that you can put on the canvas at all. You've accepted your fate to the point where it is, and there's nothing that you can put on. And so you have no brushes. Now listen carefully. I want to talk a little bit about the mind right now. It, is, it, is, it, is, it has been studied or proven that the mind, our minds are made up, or the average brain, listen carefully, the, the average brain is believed to generate up to 50,000 thoughts a day. Just, just think about that for a second. Your brain generates up to the average brain. 50,000 thoughts a day. So I, I just did a quick calculation. If it's over, let's say 16 hours that we really are awake. That's 3,125 thoughts an hour. You still with me? This is further what the study shows. The study shows that of the thousands of thoughts a person has every day, it is estimated that 70% of this mental chatter, painting, sketching, is negative. Self-critical, pessimistic, and fearful. 70%. Now, now, I want you just to calculate that. I want you just to try and think about that right now. If you were to translate the 70% negative into 70% positive, where would you have been today if you did that five years ago? 
How much further wouldn't you have progressed if you started doing that five years ago? Translating the negativity, being self-critical about yourself, about people, about pessimistic about things, about society, about church, about all sorts of things. You know people like that? You see, our minds are made up of many things, and a lot of it is words and images. Tell your neighbor, you're painting every day. <laughs> Something bad might have happened to you today or yesterday. You automatically paint an image. You paint that on a canvas. It's there. Because it affected your emotions. It's an image that stays in your mind. You see, you will always refer to the picture you painted yesterday. Let me help you this morning. If you painted an ugly picture yesterday or last month, you'll always refer to that picture. But imagine this, of the 50,000 average people, now some of us are above average here. <laughs> above average, because your minds work over, over time. 50,000 is not enough for your brain. You need more. Gives you a bit of excitement. That's why your brushes are all broken. Because you're working overtime. Come on now. You've worn out your brushes. And every time you enter a new day with a new canvas, you have all the other canvases that are painted. And someone comes to you with a similar situation. You're faced with a similar situation. You refer to the old canvas, the old painting that you painted, because that's the only point of reference that you have. Come on now. God wants to free you. That's why every day is a new day with a new canvas. Because if you're going to paint this image today that looks like the image of yesterday which was not good you perpetuate the cycle in your life and it never changes but if I make a decision today to change and say I'm throwing away the grey, I'm throwing away the black I'm getting me some new brushes I'm putting all the colour down here and I'm deciding to change my life I'm picking it up and I'm painting something beautiful because I know tomorrow when I'm faced with the same thing I can look back and I'll say, but that was a beautiful painting. I can do it. If I could do it yesterday, I can do it today. <sighs> We're stuck at a point where we accept fate. God says, I've not given you a measure of fate. But I've given you a measure of faith. You have a choice to love the person. It takes faith to love someone. Lots of faith for some people. Help me here. Especially the family. Come on now. It takes faith. Here's a good example. You always refer to the picture you painted yesterday. The painting you painted yesterday. When you think of, you give you a good example. Think of school quickly. Think about that teacher. Quickly. Die on a racer. That teacher. Then tell me what image pops up in your head. 
Come on now. You painted quickly, very quickly. You referred to that painting very quickly now. Kyle, you're smiling. Because you, you created an image in your mind of that individual, of what they are like, their personality traits, and how they, will, they always were with you. So whenever you meet someone similar to that, that's the image you're going to create, the image you're going to paint on your canvas moving forward. Instead of making a decision saying, you know, I'm going to choose to love this person. Are you with me now? I'm, ch- I'm going to choose to think differently about this person. These are the things that we meditate on. These images remain in our mind. While we go through all of these challenges in life, and your challenges are unique here. Each one of you, your challenges are unique. I don't know everything that you are going through right now, but God definitely does. And God wants us to remain faithful to the cause that he's called us. You see, David, God called him. When one failed, God called David. He called him. God remains faithful to fight your cause. You don't have to fight your cause. God will fight your cause for you. You see, all David had to do was to show up. There are many people in this place. You're anointed. You are anointed. But the Bible says, many are called, but few are chosen. You know why they're not chosen? Because they don't show up. They don't show up. You need to show up like David showed up. He was in the field which he loved doing, looking after his sheep. But he took instruction from his father. And he went to the field, to the battlefield. Listen carefully. David never sat on his anointing. Some people sit on their anointing. That's not where it's supposed to be. David is challenged by his brothers. His position is challenged. I don't know about you. When you're anointed, you'll always be challenged. If you tell me today, Apostle, I am not challenged. There are no challenges in my life. Then I will sit down and I'll let you preach to us. But the mere, the mere fact that you are challenged is because you're anointed. And the enemy is trying to get you to back down. The enemy is trying to you to forget about this race, forget about this cause, forget about this church, forget about this man, forget about this woman. Let's just, let's just leave, let's just give everything up. Anybody feel like that at some point in their life? Just giving up? It all just became too much. Oh, the challenges are just too great. It's because you're anointed. And the enemy had recognized the anointing upon your life. He recognizes the anointed. And so you'll challenge the anointed. The Bible says David was anointed. So Samuel came in and anointed him. But he was not king. He was just anointed. He was anointed to be king. You see, God called you to be someone great, but you're not great yet. There's certain things that you have to do. Things like submission. David had to submit to instruction still. He didn't get a big head because the prophet, 
Those days the prophets were, they spoke to kings. He didn't get a big head because this guy that sits next to the king came. Oh, now I'm also great. No. He went back, looked after his sheep. In fact, he even served Saul, the Bible says. From that point, he went to serve the king. You want to know how to be king? Start serving the king. That's how you learn to be king. You learn to know what is royalty like? Start serving royalty. Start serving royalty. Then you'll know what royalty is like. How I'm supposed to behave. The Bible says, David served Saul in the palace. He played his harp. He probably polished his shoes. Whatever he did. This man was anointed to be king, but he served. He didn't accept his fate being in the field, looking after sheep. He said, I'm going to use my faith. And Lord, whenever that happens, when I'm anointed to be king, I know it will happen on your time, not on my time. It's your time that matters, not my time that matters, Lord. Come on now. Because we always put a time with the Lord. Say, oh Lord, you have to come through now. God says, no I don't. Come on now. He served. He served. He waited patiently. He didn't seek position. He didn't seek position. He served. David never showed up under his own authority. He showed up because his father sent him. He was under authority. When he got to that field, he didn't go out of his own. Come on, did he know there's a battle going on? He knew there's a battle going on. He didn't say, I must for me that hate it. I for me that hate it. Do you see that in the Bible? No. He probably went there, busy taking the fleas out of all the sheep there. Doing all sorts of stuff in the van. Eventually his father says, son, come, 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 come. I need to send you to the battle. And he thought, "Ah, maybe today, Lord. Maybe today, but I'm under authority. My daddy sent me. I need to do what he told me to do. Come on now. The Bible says, now let me just help you this morning. Whenever you go to a battle, go prepared. David went after he'd seen and he'd heard and he said, you see, it's, it is the, the, the Goliath. Goliath challenged the God in David. When he heard Goliath, he challenged the God inside of David. And David rose up at that point. And he said, I, I need to do something. I cannot be quiet because I know who I am. I'm not, I'm not a, a man of faith. I'm a, na- a man of faith. And I know that this is not something this that is rising up on the inside of me. I have to do something with this. I need to say something to someone. Let me just tell my family how I feel about this. And what did his family say? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? No, man, you mustn't trust those people. Come on now. The first people that reacted was the family. But not you can take that his cap and do you simple. They never recognized the anointing upon his life. Even though they were present when the prophet was there and anointed him. Chose him above all of them. So this is what he did. 
He ch- he's challenged, but he doesn't stop there. And he shouts louder. Because he wants others to hear. He had to break through these, this family. And eventually, the Bible says it was like a chain reaction and it got to Saul. And Saul said, bring that, bring that kid here. And he said, I can, I can fight this guy. And Saul questioned, thought, okay, take my arm. And he said, no, no, no. I'll use my own stuff. I'll use what God gave me. I'll use the tools that God trained me in. The anointing that he gave, the unique anointing that he gave me. I will, I will not be like Apostle Calvin or Prophet Perry. I will be like who he called me to be. God doesn't duplicate people. He doesn't clone the people. You need to have your own personality. Your own anointing. We were in a church. Bless his darling heart. Lord help me. Our pastor. We're in a church and our pastor did things a certain way. Like some of you, if we have a comedy evening, I'm sure all of you will make lots of fun of everybody, even me. (laughs) Of all my antics that that happened here. And some of you will probably do it very well. So in any case, our pastor did all sorts of things in a certain way. Like he would, he would worship in a certain way. Remember now you go. You know. <laughs> but it's just the way he did. Yeah. yeah. Just certain things that he did. And there was a guy. Was it his armor bearer? Yeah, it was his armor bearer. Did everything exactly the way the pastor did it. The pastor would pray in tongues. Like this. And he would go. I'm new in this church and I'm looking at this guy. I don't know all these spiritual things, but I'm thinking, this is not right. And the hairstyle as well. But he didn't have the same grain of hair. So he must have worked very hard to get it that way. I can assure you. He must have gotten up very early in the morning just to get it right. I'm saying this for a reason. And uh, everything, it's a walk, even the walk. I don't even remember how he walked. Even the walk, you know. Everything, even the the speech. Well, you know, you know. Like, I wanted to shake him and say, "Where is this real guy?" And I'll never forget the pastors went away. And those of you that are old enough here to remember, no, no, maybe we the older generation spiritually. The Toronto Blessing, anybody heard of the Toronto Blessing that took place in 1995, 96? Still a bit junior here. In any case, there was called the Toronto Blessing, which was an outpouring of the, a unique outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a revival that was taking place in Toronto, where people would just step in the, the door and just, boom, fall flat on their face and they'll just, they can't move. And God just starts, there's a laugh, you know, Dr. Brian stuff, come and then they'll just be rolling in laughter and they call that the Toronto Blessing. And um, he, the past, our pastors went over and they went to this, uh, to this Toronto Blessing and they came back and they were preaching. No, they, before you even took the pulpit, then the worship started. And during worship, Little man was busy again with his antics. And the spirit of the Lord took that man. I've never seen something like this in my life. This guy started spinning like a top. Like like that. But all around the church. And as he was spinning, he said, Sorry, Pastor Steve. Sorry, Pastor Steve. Sorry, Pastor Steve. Apologizing because he can't stop himself. 
was echt dronk. <coughs> he's apologizing because he's acting out of character. But when he doesn't realize that wasn't his character that he was acting in in the first place. So God wanted to do, show him something. I don't know if he ever got delivered. But God was proving a point. And I want to say that to you today. Don't try and be like someone else. Be who God called you to be. If you try and be like someone else, God will embarrass you. He will embarrass you publicly. Or I will. <laughs> and you know I will. Listen, David was prepared. He didn't need armor. He went with what he knew. Do I have some time here? <sighs> I'm, I'm, I've just got a few lines that I need to go through. Then I'm going to be, my wife's looking at me. Can I continue? Yes. <laughs> David went. He prepared himself. He knew, he went with the stuff that he knew best. He went with the sling and he took five stones. Now if you read in scripture, there's a reason why he specifically took five stones. You see, you don't, you don't only really think for the now. You need to think generationally. You see, David knew if he goes now, he's going to take the entire Philistine army out. He's not going to leave one left behind. You can go and read for yourself. It's in, um, I don't know if I've, I've, I've I think it's in, in 1 Samuel chapter 6. six or in, in 1 Sam, I don't know if I've written it down here, but... You can go and read or just, just go and search it in your, in your Bible. There were five lords, five lords that were lorded over different areas. Goliath was one lord over Gath. But there were other areas called, it's 1 Samuel 6, yes. 1 Samuel 6, Ashdod was a lord over Ashdod. There was a lord over Gaza. There was a lord over Ash, Ashkelon. There was a lord over Ekron. And then there was a lord over Gath. You see, David made sure that if he took Goliath out, if Ashkon came or Gaza came, he'd be ready for them too. He'd be ready for them too. You need, when you go into battle, you need to go prepared. You need to know your enemy. He studied his enemy. He knew his enemy. He knew there were five lords. If I kill, I kill them all. I kill them all. It was symbolic to God. Those five stones saying, I'm going to take out. Don't leave the enemy to your children. Don't bequeath them to your children. Because if you don't take them out, they'll wait for your children. Listen carefully. This is the next thing. Too many of us fight this fight on our own. Too many of us go into this battle on our own. In our own strength. David never approached Goliath in his own name. Never. He went, he said, in the name of the Lord. When you go to battle, you go in the name of the Lord. You don't go in your own name. You don't go in your own strength. You go in the name of the Lord. He is the one that fights the battle for you. Listen carefully. Saul accepted his fate. The Bible says when David came onto the battlefield, what was Israel doing? They were running. Every time Goliath opened his mouth, they ran. Ah! They were so afraid, the Bible says. So afraid. <sighs> ran back. What was Saul? Saul doing? He accepted fate. He accepted defeat. But when David showed up, David never accepted fate. He said, this day, my God will prevail. He accepted faith because he knew the God that he served. Listen carefully. David understood serving 
in the process of serving, you discover yourself. In the process of him serving his father. In the process of him serving Saul. He discovered what he has on the inside. A kingly anointing. He realized he had a kingly anointing. This is what I want to say. And you can write this down. You cannot approach your wall without your warrior. You cannot approach your wall without your warrior. The Bible says in Revelations says in the book of Revelations, verse chapter 19, on a white horse, and he sat thereon, called faithful and true, and in in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Are you with me this morning? The Bible says that we serve a God that maketh war. You cannot enter a war without taking your warrior. Your God has to be with you. Every one of us will face a war. All wars. It's inevitable. It won't be one. might be many. I'm going to just flip this a little bit. And talk on the other scripture. Which is going to be just two, three minutes. Every one of us will face storms in life. David faced a war. The disciples faced a storm. It can be the same thing. Your war can be a storm. It's a challenge. Remember this. The storm comes to elevate your faith. The storm doesn't come to blow you over. It comes to cause you to rise. To elevate your faith. There are certain ships. Let me help you. The Bible says they were in what? A ship. I can speak a lot about this, but I'm just to talk on two. Two ships. Tell the neighbor two ships. The disciples were in one ship. Three ships. Two ships. Two ships. I'm going to talk about two ships. If I talk about three ships, I won't stop. <laughs> there are certain ships in life that can handle the storms in life. Certain ships. Two ships. One of the ships are relationship. Relationship. But let me help you here. How many of you have relationships here? Everyone. Now you have various forms of relationship. But let me, let me help you out. It you, doesn't mean that you have relationship, but it is a strong ship. Come on now. Because how many of you have relatives here? Come on now. You have relatives. So that's a relationship. You're related by the blood. Right? So there's a relationship. But it doesn't help you have a relationship. But there's no fellowship. There's the other ship. Because I can be relationally connected to my brother or my sister in the blood. But I have no fellowship with them. It doesn't help me. You see, these disciples were in a ship. Relationally, they probably knew Jesus or they thought they knew Jesus very well. But when it came to the point where they thought they were going to die, they were about to accept their own fate. Instead of them doing something about it themselves. Because if I'm in relationship with you, I'm in fellowship with you. And if I'm in fellowship with the God of heaven and earth, then I know I have the same power that he has. And I can do the same things that he can do. But something tells me they had relationship, but there wasn't enough fellowship. 
so their faith could not grow to the point where it needed to grow. And the reason why the church lacks faith is because they lack fellowship. If you're not in fellowship with the Lord, you might know the Lord, but you don't know him intimately. If you don't have the fellowship with him, your ship is not going to stand in the storm. No, but it's okay, I'll stay, I'll stay in the harbor. Let me tell you something, ships are not meant for the harbor. Ships are meant for the sea. Don't say, oh, I guess failure here. No, they're meant for the sea. You have to be on the water. Because everything is faith. Everything is faith. I don't know about you. I don't expect you to be like the disciples to accept their faith. They eventually had to run to Jesus and wake him up. And he looked at them and he said, My Lord, how long have you been with me? Did you not see me do all the things and yet you have no faith? You have no faith. Where is your faith? You're accepting faith. You're accepting your condition. You're accepting where you are. Your job and everything. You're accepting that. And you're saying this is where I'll stand. And I'm not going to go further. I don't know about you. But I'm not accepting where I am. I'm not accepting faith. My condition might say one thing. But my Bible says something else. Your condition says one thing, but the word of God says something completely different. You see, what happened to the disciples weren't writ- wasn't written yet in the word of God. It's for us to learn from. We have the word of God now. They were rebuked in person. I'm glad I'm not rebuked in person. I can just open the word and I'm like, oh, rebuke, oh, rebuke. But imagine the Lord himself came and stood and rebuked me. Come on now. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Jesus said, Where is your faith? I want to encourage you this morning. You can either be faithful or you can be faithful. Let us stand this morning.